if we want to develop machines with general intelligence that surpasses ours, they would be in a very powerful position. Hi, this is Ryan Bailey for Reason TV, and today we're talking with uh, Professor of Philosophy at Oxford University, Nick Bostrom, about his new book, Superintelligence, Paths, Dangers, and Strategies. What's the book about? Well, it's about um, the potential for a transition to a machine intelligence era. If we want to develop machines with general intelligence that surpasses ours, they would be in a very powerful position. So how, how much smarter could these machines be? Well, the sky is the limit. A kind of fundamental constraints on information processing in biological substrates. So we know human neurons are very slow. Uh, there is like a finite volume you can have as your brain. And maybe you could make it 10% larger, but you couldn't have a head the size of a warehouse. Uh, these don't apply to machine brains. So in principle, they could radically surpass what biology can do. Well, the analogy you use in the book, as I understand it, that we would stand in relation to AI, AIs, artificial intelligences, super intelligences, as we stand in relation to the intelligence of worms or beetles. Is that something like that, something yeah. Like I mean, that. at some point, the concepts kind of begin to break down, but intuitively, yeah. Does super intelligence pose an existential risk to humanity? And so an existential risk is one that either um, threatens to cause the extinction of earth originating intelligent life or to permanently and drastically destroy our potential for desirable future development. But it looks, if we think about these um, rapid takeoff scenarios, we have a super intelligence so far ahead of everything else that it would be able to shape the future according to its will. Right. Now, if you start to think through for most possible final goals that such an artificial agent might have, what would be involved in maximally realize, realizing one of those goals? Uh, most of them will tend to involve as a side effect, the destruction of, of the human species and everything we care about. So as an example, suppose you have a, an AI whose only goal is to make as many paper clips as possible. And maybe we built it to run a paper clip factory. Uh, so then if you are a super intelligent and you try to figure out how can I ensure that there are as many paper clips as possible in the future, for, for a start, you would want to prevent anybody from shutting you off because you can predict if you get shut off, there will be fewer paper clips. So right away, if you could eliminate humans, that would increase your level of safety since humans might one day decide they don't like you. So now if you replace paperclip with almost any other goal you could imagine, like most of them will have this sort of consequence that, that humans are not the optimal way of realizing those goals. There might be a small subset, very special kinds of goals, um, which in order to maximally realize, you would have to preserve humanity. Like if the goal actually involved our values in it, then you can't maximally realize our values by just killing us all off, probably. Right. So the, the big challenge then is to reach into this huge space of possible sort of mind designs or motivation system designs and try to pick out one of the very special ones that, that would be consistent with, with human survival and flourishing. And that, that's what you spend a great deal of, uh, of the book uh, dealing with is what, uh, how is it that we, you call it the control problem, I guess, is largely yeah. what it is. So how do humans, in a certain sense, maintain control of the superintelligence so that it wants to keep us around and benefit us? Um, so one is um, capability control methods. This would be where you try to limit what the AI is able to do. Maybe put it in a box, you disconnect the Ethernet cable, um, maybe you only allow it to communicate by typing text on, on a screen, and then some human gatekeeper reads that and answer, or asks its questions, and you restrict its capability. So you call this an oracle. Well, th this would be one, one, yeah, one, one way of trying to implement that. Okay. Um, and um, I think those kinds of capability control methods uh, would be useful during the developmental phase, particularly. Um, I don't think they are the, the ultimate answer to this. Um, I think we will eventually need to reach for a different kind of uh, solution to the control method, namely motivation selection methods. This is where Instead, or in addition to trying to limit what the system can do, you try to engineer it in such a way that it would not want to cause harm. You try to build its motivation system so that it in some sense either shares our values or has some very limited motivation that, that would disincentivize it from, from trying to do things that we don't want. More generally, how do we get to uh, friendly and beneficial super intelligence? Yes, yeah, so I discussed a number of specifics in the book. I think one thing 
um, that's kind of obvious, but um, worth emphasizing is to try to accelerate work on the control problem. This is the problem of how you would control a super intolerant agent. There's very little resources going into that in the world today. Maybe like half a dozen people are working on that full time, something like that. And that's only in the last few years. Whereas there are tens of thousands, if not millions, depending on your definition, who are working on developing faster hardware or better algorithms or developing like AI. We've got to get the control problem solved before we solve the AI problem, how to build an AI. There. We want to solve both of these problems, but in the correct order. So looking at the horizon of things, what is the earliest time you think that some sort of super intelligent AI could be created? And what do you think is the likely amount of time that would take? It's not so far. We ran a survey of, of uh, experts in AI uh, and asked them, by what year do you think there is a 50% chance that we will have human-level machine intelligence? Uh, and the median answer to that was uh, 2040 or 2050, depending on exactly which group we asked. Um, now, there's a lot of uncertainty around that, so it could happen much sooner uh, or much later. And we need to think about the probability distribution really smeared out. Over, exactly. like it could, could happen in, in five or 10 years. It's very unlikely. Uh, more likely in a couple of decades, I guess. It could take the rest of this century or it could take longer. And we, we just need to live with the, the uncertainty there and sort of plan accordingly. Seems like it's going to be a, an interesting problem for the rest of the century anyway. Thank you very much, Nick, for coming by and talking to us here at Reason. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Okay. Good to see you. Mm -hmm.